All right, let's jump right in. I promised you some um, public key cryptography. I promised you to explain what all these abbreviations mean that we saw in connection with the servers. And one of those abbreviations was Diffie-Hellman, or DH. And so here is a stereotypical example of a Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Now, just to get you away from things that you have seen so far, let me describe this in a somewhat different setting. So we're going to pick some group which are going to write additives. So the group operation is going to be P plus P, not, as you might have seen, G times G. So I'm using additive notation. And then I'm going to take just multiples of P. And so for this group that I'm looking at, P is going to be a generator. I'm going to look only at P, 2P, 3P, 4P, 5P, etc. for a long time. Okay, so when I write A times P, that means we're taking A copies of P and then adding them up. So that's P plus P plus P plus P, well, until we hit all of the A copies. And here's how the Hellman key exchange works. So Alice picks some secret that's an integer, lowercase a. So this is what Alice does privately at home. And then she computes a public key. And as I said before, public keys can be posted online. So she does this computation of a times p. And then this can be put online. So everybody, including Bob here, can see this a times p. Now Bob, when he wants to talk to Alice, or maybe he has done this before. Now a server example, it's typically the server, let's say Alice, she posts this online because she has an identity, she is hyperlipstick.org, and Bob is just the normal user, that's you and your browser, let's call the browser Bob. So Bob is um, at that moment only making a secret key and then a public key, but the operations are very analogous to what Alice is doing. So Bob picks an integer b, computes b times p, and then also this is, can be made public, and so Alice can retrieve this public key. So any attacker is sitting in the middle of this picture here. So Eve, our eavesdropper, can spy on everything that's happening in this middle part. And then Alice and Bob, while now having each other's public keys and their own secret keys, can do the computation that's written there. So let's stay on the Alice side. So Alice knows her secret lowercase a, and she knows Bob's public key, B times P. And so she computes A times this point, we call this public key. Um, and then she obtains, well, if you're taking 2 times 3 times anything, that is 6. So the two integers, A times P, multiply. And it's that many times A, B times that point. And now Bob can do the same, knowing his secret key, B, and Alice's public key, A, P. And so he also gets, well, he gets b a times p, but on the integers it's commutative, so you can flip the order between a p a b and b a. So both of them now have the a times p multiple of p. Okay, this should give you lots and lots of questions. So what does this p look like? What is it? What am I supposed to think of here? And how do I actually do this computation? P plus p, or well, p plus some other group element q. And we're going to learn about this today, some example, and we're going to see some better examples soon. But I just first want to get you away from things that you're too familiar with. So I'm going to show you a very unusual example. Also, you should ask yourself, hey, um, there was this claim that for a good system, at least, it should be hard to do this error here in reverse. It should be hard to go from the public key to the secret key. And yes, absolutely, there are lots and lots of groups where that is easy. So in cryptography, we're looking for particular groups where this is a one-way function or computation, where going from B to B times P is easy, but going from B times P up to P, B is hard. Okay, so, well, let's jump in. Let's do that. So here's an example, and this is an example in some sense you're very familiar with because I assume you got your first introduction to the science of clocks in kindergarten or well, primary school, wherever you had your first clock education. Now we're going to do a little bit of more of a math approach, so we're also going to introduce coordinates. So our points on this clock here, uh, well, they all satisfy that they're distance one away from the center of this clock. So they all satisfy that when you take the x-coordinate square, 
and you add to it the y coordinate squared of this point, then you're getting 1. And let me also point out that there's a warning. This is a circle. Now, circles are special ellipses, but an ellipse is not an elliptic curve. We are on the way to elliptic curves. We're not going to get there today. So don't confuse these two things. Also, it's called elliptic curve, not elliptical curve. It's not a fitness instrument. It's a secure crypto system. Okay, let's get to points on this curve. So some points you should be familiar with are the 12 o'clock point noon, and you shouldn't have any problems given these coordinates. So this point up here, well, you look at the x coordinate, that's zero, and the y coordinate is one. Similarly, the six o'clock point down here, well, that has x again being zero, but y is minus one. And there are some more nice points. There's a one zero, the three o'clock point, and there's a minus one zero. The nine o'clock point. And you can easily convince yourself that when you're taking the x squared, x coordinate squared, the y coordinate squared, you're getting one. Because, well, one is one, the other one is zero. There are some more complicated points. So, what time is it when it is square root of three quarters and one half? That's not what you learned in kindergarten, but you know this time. So the one half over here gives it away. So it says that the y coordinate is one half. So when you go in the y coordinate halfway up, so that's about here, and then you go over to where you hit the circle. Ah, okay. So that point we actually know as two o'clock. And you can verify that this is not the curve. And you can also verify that this really gives the two o'clock point that you know and love. There are more such points. There is the x coordinate being halfway over and then the y coordinate down. Okay, that's 5 o'clock. There is the x coordinate at minus 1 half. And then the, okay, well, we're just flipping the y co uh, the, yeah, the x coordinate, flipping the sign. So if this was 5 o'clock, then this must be 7 o'clock. And then there's also, say, halfway here, both coordinates being the same. So that's the 130 point. And then there are points which are not just awkward because they include like square roots, which you can motivate with uh, trigonometrics, but there's also a point like three fifths, four fifths. Verify it's on the curve, it definitely is, as are also the numbers with minus sign in the different positions. All of these points are on the curve, but finding what time it is when it's three fifths, four fifths, well, that's not what you learn in kindergarten, and it's definitely not one of the normal times that you would appoint, uh, put in for an appointment. And there are many more points. You can also flip the x coordinate and the y coordinate, and again you can flip with the sine terms. And well, once you see these numbers, you might actually recognize these as 3, 4, and 5 being a Pythagorean triple, meaning that 3 squared plus 4 squared is 5 squared. And okay, since I want a 1 over here, I divide by the z squared, so I have, well, x divided by z and y divided by z, so there are many, many Pythagorean triples, and so that way you can get many, many more points on the clock, if you need any. Okay, so let's turn to the next step where we now have our elements. We now want to have some addition. We want to have our p plus p. And so I'm going to define addition as the addition of two points p by the angle. So we have here a point p1, which is at angle alpha 1, and we have here point p2, which is at alpha 2. That's all the way from here. Now, let me take a moment for those who are too mathematically trained. I'm putting the 0 up here, and I'm going clockwise, because we're on the clock. If you're used to the unit circle, then you're typically going counterclockwise, and you put in the neutral element here, this is addition on the clock, and there is a good reason for doing it, which will become clear in one of the next lectures. And okay, once you're around once, once you have reached 360 degrees, well, you're back to zero. Let's see. Yeah, this looks like it's actually a group operation. We, all we're doing is just addition alpha 1 plus alpha 2 modulo 360. And that is a typical example of a group that you know. Addition of integers or well, rational numbers modulo 360. You know that the neutral element is all the way up here at the angle being 0, so that's the point zero, 01. And if you're taking this angle plus this angle, well, it just means taking this pizza piece here 
and putting it next to the larger piece and you get this piece all the way to P3. So on the clock, it's the same whether you're adding the angles, whether you're adding the pizza pieces themselves, or whether you're adding pieces of the radius. It all is nicely, you know, it all scales, it's all the same. Well, I'm going by angles because that's what I'm going to expand on. So. Okay, so the point, the six o'clock point, that has angle 180. And so if I add this to itself, well, if I add it to itself, I'm going to get 360, which is zero again. So that point has order two. So if I'm looking for a good point for the Jigahaman key exchange, that's definitely not it. I don't want to have a point where after two times I'm back to zero because then I only have two different elements, even if Alice is showing me a huge A. It's either that point or that point. Not a good choice. So I want to have something which well, has infinite order or very, very large order. We're going to see that for the groups that we like, infinite order is not an option, but we're going to go for something which is very, very large. But on the clock, we have some other points which are easier to analyze, which have small order. So the three o'clock point and the nine o'clock point, so over here at 90 degrees, over here at 270, or easier to think of as minus 90 degrees, well, four times 90 is 360, so that one gets you also to zero. So those points have order four. You can also go for, say, the point at 130, that one has order eight, and you can look at other points that are like 60 degrees or 30 degrees and find out their order. Okay, so we're looking like we're having a group operation and also, well, let me highlight if I have a point over here, P1, then minus P1 is at minus alpha. So I'm just going in the negative direction or minus alpha is the same as 360 minus alpha. I find it shorter to go centered around zero, so I'm writing minus 90, but that's the same as 270. So with these observations, we can see that we have a group under addition of angles. So we have the neutral element, we have an inverse. Well, if I take any two points, I'm going to be on, on the curve again, because, well, any two angles will be another angle. And then also associativity, well, it's just addition of, uh, of numbers module 360, and that you have seen as a typical example of associative operations. It's even a commutative operation. It doesn't matter whether you add P1 to P2 or you're adding P2 to P1, whether you're doing this pizza piece and that pizza piece, or first the big one and then the small. Now, we can get this into formulas, but we can't actually use this for adding the, the points that I actually pointed out with the Pythagorean triple. How do you add 3 fifths to 4 fifths? This? We can figure out what angle this is and then get it, but it's some ugly angle. It's not a nice angle. But we learned a little bit more in, in well, calculus or trigonometry, and we're not going to see much calculus in here, or analysis, wherever you learned this, but at this moment I need it for just a moment. So I've been talking about this unit circle here, and that's the curve equation again, the x squared plus y squared is 1, and I'm going to parametrize my variables by this alpha. So the x-coordinate here, this distance here, that is the opposite side of the angle, so that's the sine. And the y-coordinate, that's the cosine of alpha. And then if I'm asking myself, well, if I add a point p1 to a point p2 with the coordinates, well, at alpha 1 and alpha 2, then where does this point p3 live? So I'm looking at the sine of alpha 1 plus alpha 2, that will be the x-coordinate of this p3, and the cosine of alpha 1 plus alpha 2, that's going to be the y-coordinate of p3. And then, well, long, long time ago, we learned these formulas, namely that we can expand the sine of alpha 1 plus alpha 2 into, okay, so this was the sine of alpha 1 cosine alpha 2 plus the cosine of alpha 1 times the sine of alpha 2. So the sign of these two things is always the mixed one, which just the orders flipped. Okay, we can also do the cosine, right? Okay, we get this. So the cosine of alpha 1 plus alpha 2. Now the cosine was the one which is keeping them together and it has the minus sign. So it's the cosine alpha 1, cosine alpha 2, minus the sine of alpha 1, sine of alpha 2. 
And now the nice thing is that if I translate this into coordinates, like Cartesian coordinates, into x and y, okay, so the sine of alpha 1, that's the x1, this is the y2, this is the y1, this is the x1. So I can actually write this in the coordinates, and also the, the second coordinate, the cosine, is given in the x and the y of the points. So to spell this out, if I'm taking x1, y1 plus x2, y2, let's call this result x3, y3, then the x3 is the x1, y2 plus y1, x2, and the y3 is the y1, y2, x1 minus x1, x2. So it's just tracing from this formula to this formula. So replacing the sine and cosine with, well, x and y, and keeping track of which one is 1, which one is 2. And now this one I can actually use to add 3 fifths and 4 fifths, that, that point to itself. And well, I've done here, so if I'm taking the um, x coordinate of the first one times the y coordinate of the second, plus the y coordinate of the first one times the x coordinate of the second, so that's what I'm writing out here, and if I cross multiply this I'm getting 12 twenty fifths plus 12 twenty fifths, so the sum is 24 twenty fifths. And then in the y coordinate, I'm having 4 times 4 over 25, so 16, minus 3 times 3, so 16 minus 9 is 7, so that's the 7 over 27, so now, uh, over 25. So now I can actually do this operation, and now I can give a meaning to what I've been writing about Alice and Bob there before, namely that Alice is choosing A and computing A times B, and Bob is choosing B and computing B times B. So here is again written in form, that's what it means to compute, well, k times p, namely you're taking k copies of p, adding them up, and okay, I'm expecting that k is a positive number. Alright, so that's our first example. We have seen the clock as an example of a rather strange group, and I hope that that gets you out of your normal mode, where you think you know every group that's around. More to come.